Well, thank you guys for being here. Um, I'm really, really excited to introduce you to Laura. Um, I have had the privilege of working with Laura for how long now, Laura? <laughs> I don't even know how long it is. Three years? Three and a half years. Three and a half years. Yeah. And um, I appreciate her on many levels. Um, and I appreciate very much the way she thinks about things and thinks through things. And so um, I'm going to let Laura tell you a little bit about her background. But um, I, she and I, I feel like think a lot the same. We have, um, she's very great with her clients um, and very thorough. And part of the practice that she does that I don't do is she specializes in um, pelvic floor dysfunction. And so I'm gonna let her tell you a little bit how, about how she came to do that and um, how it started. So just maybe Laura, do you mind giving us a little background and what brought you to learn more in depth about the pelvic floor? Um. I started out in just general orthopedic practice um, and I ended up always seeing the difficult back pain pe people. They just always seemed to get on my schedule um, and I liked it, but I always felt like there was something that I wasn't able to assess with what I knew. Um, and it kind of all clicked when I had kids and <laughs> my pelvic floor was <laughs> disrupted. <laughs> to say the least. And I was like, oh, like this is actually really important. So um, I guess almost four years ago, I took my first um, pelvic floor class um, and I've been taking classes, like they're expensive. So like annually as a, every year since then and just kind of working in patients as I feel ready to deal with them and as they come in the door, so. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. And um, what would you say, you know, what is the main demographic of people that you see or patients that you have that have or need work in their pelvic floor? I think most, um, most are perimenopausal or postmenopausal and okay. having difficulty with mm -hmm. either the transition or I think, you know, once postpartum, always postpartum, like problems get kind of pushed off. And then once you kind of have the hormonal shifts of menopause, you can't cope as well with the changes that happened, you know, 25 years ago, and they become symptomatic at that point. Mm -hmm. Great. And um, what what is what's going on with these women a lot of the time? Like, what is actually the dysfunctions that they're? What are they complain of, and what are they? Um, I see a lot of. Um, pain, like pain with sex or just kind of achy pelvic pain. Um, I see a lot of incontinence that really tends to be not weakness, but more like dysfunction in how people use their muscles. Um, and then some prolapse that's become like comes to a head really where you can't cope with it as well as you used to at a certain point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned, I'm going to stray from our little schedule here, put you on the spot, but you mentioned that the incontinence, and I'd love to hang on to that for a little bit. Um, so from my experience, right, incontinence happens because, well, you said not, not necessarily from weakness, but from dysfunction. Um, typically when we think of somebody not being, being incontinent, we think they no longer have control over their uh, sphincter for their bladder. Um, what what do you see if it's not from weakness or um, lack of being able to control that sphincter? What else could it be? So bladder, like control of urination, is really complicated, and it's this big loop between the brain and the bladder and the pelvic floor muscles. And so if you're basically the bladder and the pelvic floor can't work at the same time. So if your pelvic floor is active, your bladder is relaxed and a relaxed bladder is filling and holding urine. Um, and then a relaxed pelvic floor should go with a contracting bladder, which is so you should relax your pelvic floor and your bladder squeezes so you can urinate. 
what I see happen in most of my incontinence patients is they're just holding their pelvic floor all the time. And so the signal from the bladder is disrupted. And so you get this urgency and dysfunctional like bladder squeezing when it shouldn't. And so you end up with situations where you like you get home and you pee your pants because your bladder thinks it's time to go or you on your way and you just leak um, less less so than the like I sneezed or I jumped on the trampoline where that's really just, you're not managing the support system as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's interesting because then you get like the, why is it so overactive? Um, which is a, a different, a whole like other question I think, but then how do you manage that? Um, and that mm -hmm. becomes more like behavioral and lifestyle and psychological, which I, I like, cause I've had people where it's like, oh my God, I'm leaking all day long. And I just make a couple of suggestions and they come back and they're like, oh my God, I, I had like one accident all day just with some simple changes. Mm -hmm. And can you give us an example of what those simple changes might be? Um, part of it is uh, you just have to stop the going just in case and the going all the time and kind of suppress those urges in a controlled way. So you, you have a chance to reprogram that like bladder, brain, pelvic floor connection. Um, so people can do deep breathing to kind of get the pelvic floor to actually relax, you know, get to the toilet in a calm way and then have a successful void. Um, there's other things you can do to suppress that urge and try to like just inch apart those spacings so you're not going quite so frequently or even just to suppress an urge and just kind of, every time you suppress an urge, I think that signal gets reprogrammed and so it's easier the next time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? I feel like I didn't explain that super well. No, I think you did. I'll, I'll rephrase it and you can tell me if I'm right or wrong and then yeah. you can correct it. <laughs> but it sounds like what you're saying is, um, and I've um, heard, uh, I'm asking a question that I've heard the answer to in different ways. So maybe uh, incorporating that too, but it sounds like it, it, you don't want to have the just thing. I, I'm going to leave and I may not find a bathroom for three hours. I don't really have to go, but I'm just going to go anyway, just in case. Yeah. Yeah, don't do that. That's <laughs> don't do that right that's yeah. not that's not helping you right. because that's just telling your body it gets to pee all the time or right. it's giving some that's what some sort of signal like that but that you um, want to only go when you actually have a full bladder and that you want to that you need to avoid it um, and then you want to actually suppress that urgency so when you feel really urgent uh, and I've heard this before too that that's not the time to go to the bathroom like you want to calm everything down and then get to the toilet and then go, but not have, uh, not have, not go while you're feeling like, oh my gosh, I'm about to go, I'm about to go, find a way to calm the system and then actually go and, and have a true full void happening. Right, so some people like, um, like breathing to relax, some people do really quick, freak, like five quick squeezes of the pelvic floor muscles and that kind of sends that inhibitory signal to the bladder. And that can give you a chance to then be in charge and take yourself to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. And then I've also heard, um, and maybe this is outside of the realm, but I've also heard that there are a lot of bladder irritants, foods, drinks, things yeah. that you, if this is an issue for you, that you could potentially avoid. Yeah. Is that, yeah. And it seems to be, there's no, like, you should avoid these hundred percent. It seems to be very person to person. I had a patient who she was convinced I was going to make her give up coffee. And it turned out that wasn't her irritant. It was carbonated water. Yeah. And yeah, I've heard carbonation could be really irritant. Um, I've heard citrus. I haven't be... seen that with too many people. It you seems haven't. to be like the coffee tea and the carbonated water. Or okay. I don't have very, no one drinks soda anymore. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> for, uh, yeah, great. Um, okay. And then um, 
what what do you think um so in treatment wise um what are things you treat you can treat help people with incontinence issues when they're related to over tightness um or and you can assess that so you, you would know that if you were to see it we might not know that though or are there signs that we could know that somebody needs to have work done in that way or how, how could we tell or what would maybe they complain of or what would we maybe see when we're working with them? I think the people that say they have a small bladder, like there's really no such thing as a small bladder in the absence of like someone who's had radiation or something. Um, so people who say they have a small bladder and they have to go like at the beginning of class and they go right at the end of class, that might be like your like yellow flag to be like, maybe they have something going on. If you're comfortable asking, the hard thing is they're kind of personal questions. So you don't want to just ask mm -hmm. anyone, but they might be good questions to ask if someone's having issues. Um, I notice when the people have an overactive pelvic floor, their abdominal ball is also usually overactive. And so if you look at them, um, I really notice it with the oblique angle where people just really grip, um, like right where, like right here, every time they contract, they just like close that down so hard that all the pressure, it just kind of all comes downward into there. And that seems to be like a really grippy spot for people. Um, people that are just constantly like, you all know what it looks like, right? When people just like suck in and it's not really functional, but they're just pulling everything in as hard as they can. It seems to be the people that are really concerned with either their physique or that they have a belly and they're trying to really hold it in all the time. Mm -hmm. um, that's the transverse abdominis and the pelvic floor in a good, in a well-functioning system should operate together. And so what you see in the transverse should um, kind of reflect what's actually happening in the pelvic floor. So you can kind of make your assessment based on that, what you're seeing at the transverse abdominis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and are there other reasons you kind of mentioned um, perimenopausal women as having a lot of dysfunction? What is the rate of dysfunction after childbirth? Or Because I've had uh, or what, what do you know? Maybe maybe I'm asking a question that's kind of, again, a little beyond, but um, what I found after having my children is that there's not a lot of information given in, in the U.S., I would say, especially to women about incontinence and issues with pelvic floor uh, before they give birth, right? It usually is, I find that women are generally, and myself was included, I was myself included in this, chasing down information after the fact, yeah. after the fact when things didn't go perfectly but nobody had mentioned that things may not go perfectly. And my mom, fortunately for her, did not have any issues after having three children. And so she didn't have any idea of what could, I had a lot of dysfunction and she had, didn't have any idea of what could be going on or what possibly could be going on. Um, is that, is it, and I've heard a lot of women um, after having kids saying, oh, I can't jump on the trampoline anymore. Or I can't when I sneeze, I get incontinent, right? Is that, would you say that's more normal that we should be looking out for that? Or is it that more the abnormal? Do, we, do I just see more of those because I work in rehab or is that really a very common thing? No, I think if you talk to people that have been, you ask these questions, almost everybody, even if it's transient, have had issues. Um, like it's common, but it's not normal. Like you shouldn't, no one should have to put up with leaking like there's something that can be done um I can't remember it's over 50 percent I think of women that have mm -hmm. some dysfunction and some you know the first year is such a healing time anyway so maybe some people yeah. have issues that first year and then it improves or it improves enough and then you know 25 years later like those are the people I'm seeing as estrogen drops those tissues aren't as elastic anymore because yeah. then they have issues um, but yeah, it's, I want to say it's like 60 to 70%, but I, I'm totally pulling that out of something I looked up a long time ago, but it's very common. It should be screened and it's so hard that 
that people have to go out of their way to get help. Mm-hmm. And I know that so go ahead, sorry. No, I just mean like California seems so progressive, but even he, it's just not mm-hmm. it should be just handed out, I think. Yeah. I know that in um, Canada they get it's kind of given to you that you have I think six or eight sessions of pelvic floor PT after childbirth um so I that's the only country I know that just gives it I think France as well does the same thing I don't actually know of other countries do that but it's more preventative I think for future problems just as you're saying um that each woman gets checked out after childbirth Uh, Let me throw something else at you. The other population, the off script again, sorry. (laughs) The other population of people that I see with a lot of incontinence issues are hypermobile people with extreme hypermobility. Can you speak to that a little bit or what your thoughts are? Yeah, I mean, there's for sure a link. If you think about the fascia, um, I brought my pelvis home so I could show you. Oh, yay. (laughs) But this is the, right, this is your pelvis and this is the inside. And so these are the pelvic floor muscles, but there's a whole sling of fascia that runs crossways to the pelvic floor muscles. And so, um, and then also with them. But if that fascia is as stretchy as everywhere else in your body and the pelvic floor is kind of supposed to be this trampoline for your pelvic organs. um, And it just kind of goes, then you're going to have overweighting and and leakage. So you're losing that support of the bladder, basically. Um, Mm -hmm. That being said, you know, same as with other joints, getting stronger should be helpful. Um, But I think that would be something where it's uh, Mm -hmm. a struggle and I think those are the women where I see have more lingering problems like the postpartum moms I've seen the ones that don't bounce back quite as quickly are just generally more hypermobile oh interesting yeah um the other thing um well let me go back to our script here I'll ask you a few questions that are actually on there (laughs) um how does the work you do vary from work that they can do with movement or at home on their own? What, what does the work entail? Because I think people don't really know so much what's happening in a session. Right. Um, so I do, I usually start a session with like a normal, like head to toe out, like close on assessment. Just look at the spine and look at the hips and look at the posture. And um, I watch people breathe because we'll, that would be like a bullet point that I can talk a lot about too, is like breathing and all of that. But, um, and then I'll usually, if it's indicated and people want to do um, like a palpation exam of the pelvic floor muscles. Um, and so one finger vaginally, and you can just palpate around, um, like if you come in right here, you can just palpate, right? All, the, all these muscles in this bowl. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I can get an idea and then I can do muscle tests there too. So I can see if there's painful spots, if it feels like it doesn't have any give or elasticity, I can do a muscle test and see strength. There's different, it's like a, you know, five out of five scale. Also, it's just a little bit different on how you score it, the endurance, and you want to have both like long holds endurance in the pelvic floor and also like quick 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 squeeze and release for you know sudden catching yourself with you know like sneezes and things like that I can check for prolapse at that point too because that's probably along with hypermobility right like if things are falling that affects continence Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm just gonna interject Sorry, oh, yeah. one second. For, for those of you who don't know, prolapse, right? It means that the organs uh, higher up, like the uterus sometimes, but sometimes the bladder itself, sometimes the rectum can prolapse or fall into the vaginal area. Um, if something gone dysfunctional there, 
too much pressure, too much pushing, or the vaginal walls are insufficient for some reason, or the fascia. And um, so you can have different degrees of prolapse, right? Grade one being very little to uh, much more grade, so much for grade three, I think is actually organs coming externally, vaginally. So there's a whole bunch of different grades of prolapse. But anyway, sorry, Laura interrupted you for that. But yes, yeah, so you can feel the, you can tell if there's a prolapse and then. And then at that point, I'll usually do, start doing functional stuff like breathing and, um, and abdominal contraction. And then I can really start to get a good idea of what, um, what are people doing when they tighten up their abdominals? Like, are they pushing everything down or is it a supportive abdominal contraction? And so you can start to kind of get an idea of what the problem is um, based on what their symptoms are. Mm -hmm. And is, are there things that Pilates can do to help the pelvic floor or to harm it or both things? I think both depending on um, what's going on and maybe not harming it indefinitely. But I think if you have someone who has a lot of pain, who's really grippy, who can't seem to relax, like Pilates isn't the first thing I have them do. Like we do a lot of relaxation and down training and getting that freedom to move the whole pelvic floor, like the full range of motion of the pelvic floor and the full range of motion of the abdominal wall. Um, but then once they kind of get that, then you need to be strong. Like a tight muscle isn't necessarily strong. And so most of those people do need strengthening down the line. It's just, you want them to learn how to do it in a functional way. So they're not exacerbating their problems. Mm -hmm. And the two main problems I've seen uh, are one, either putting pressure downward, which you mentioned. So especially with an upper abdominal curl situation where they're just pushing down and out. Yeah. Um, and the other one is tightening and holding and never releasing. Right. Right. So are there, uh, does that resonate with you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So do you think there are times where um, I was trying to, to help us understand when is it appropriate for us to work with somebody or how would we know that those are things we should be careful of if, if they haven't seen a pelvic floor specialist? Are there some good questions we could ask or some signs or things that we could uh, try and look for that might help us realize if either of those things are happening? I think it would be reasonable on an intake to ask your client if they have issues with leaking or pain. Um, mm -hmm. You're always asking about pain, right? And you say, oh, does your low back pain, do you have pelvic pain? People who have pelvic pain know what you mean. And so we could, they would know what to answer. And then if they're leaking, that's either like, yes, you should do you know, lots of strengthening or strengthening with caveats. Um, I think for, and from what I've seen everybody do, you guys are great. Like people need to breathe in and breathe out and not just hold it and work the whole time at that full contraction, but get that full range of motion like you do with all the other joints. And so if you're doing that and people aren't, you know, bearing down with their contractions, um, I think it's fairly safe. The caveat would be like, if you're working with someone who said they leak, you're working with them a couple of weeks and they tell you it's getting worse, um, it would be a good idea to have them assessed. Mm -hmm. if their pain is that their leaks get worse because yeah. something's happening in their pelvis right. is not ideal. Right, great. And then are there times where I had a friend who also a PT, but she said, I finally went to a Pilates class. This was after her second baby she said and I loved the class but I had more incontinence after I did the class and um the my assumption was either she tightened up so much that it fatigued her and she right. could no longer be continent anymore or that she was bearing down while she's doing the exercise and pushing <laughs> on her organs so she's putting more pressure downward um I I don't know which one it was but would th those would be good uh, good guesses as to if somebody complained of 
that. Right. If someone who's super weak comes to a class and like that, uh, like that afternoon, maybe they leak more, but then the next day it's back to baseline. I'd be less concerned about that than someone who's having like a more consistent increase. Right. So if someone's over fatiguing, that's maybe back off a little bit next time, but you need to fatigue a muscle to get it stronger. Um, so that's okay, okay as long as the overall trend is good. If someone is like, oh, I go through, you know, two pads a day and now I'm using four pads a day, like every day last week, like that's a problem. Mm -hmm. okay. that more consistently going in the wrong direction. Um, yeah. You know, and then if someone's leaking during your class or your session, they're definitely not managing their pressure well. And so that's a yeah. if, if they're not able to feel what's happening, that might be a good opportunity for someone to get in there and help them with the actual muscles. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, let me see. Precautions wise, I think we've talked about that. Um, could, could I pick your brain? I'm very interested in what you have to say about breathing. Since you have been talking a lot about it, could you tell us a little bit more about how the breathing can help or? So um, your like trunk is basically a canister. So you have your diaphragm on top and your pelvic floor beneath, and then your abdominals wrap around. And there's a relationship between the diaphragm and the pelvic floor. So when you take a nice diaphragmatic breath in, like where you're, belly and your lower ribs expand, your diaphragm expands and drops and your pelvic floor lengthens and drops um, down towards your feet if you're standing. Um, that's really one of the best ways to, to stretch the pelvic floor. Like you can't like throw your leg, up. you can kind of, but you can't just like throw your leg up and really get a good stretch in the pelvic floor. The best way to do it is this nice, breathing. So you breathe in, let your belly rise even more. So like feel air come into your pelvis as you exhale. Don't let people like push it out with their muscles, but just let it come back up to its resting point. Um, that in different positions, you can kind of target it. If there's one side by having people, you know, lie on one side and block the other side. Um, but then once people can do that, using that breath to control their pressure when they're working can really help with continence too. Because if you think about if this was like, like a balloon and you squeeze in the middle, all the extra balloons going to come up here and the other part's going to bulge down here. So if people are just kind of squeezing through the middle and aren't managing the pressure up at below, above and below, you get too much pressure on the pelvic floor. So you want the whole thing to kind of support from the bottom um, and the abdominal wall. So you protect all that fascia in the pelvic floor and keep things where they should be. So I, that's really, once people are past the first couple sessions and we kind of have a good handle on, like I know they can do a functional contraction. They've got kind of their you know, urge suppression stuff going, then we start doing like squats or pick stuff up the ground, especially people with babies, right? Like, can you pick up a 20 pound weight and feel like you have control here and you're using your breath so you're not just, you know, pushing down, yeah, valsalva, <laughs> squeezing <laughs> everything, yeah, <laughs> to give yourself stability that way that you can give yourself muscular stability. And that's where Pilates is so great because like so much like footwork is so functional. It's like all these squats and it's such an easy way to practice your breath control because you're not worrying about standing your balance and you don't have as much pressure on your pelvic floor. So I do tons of footwork, changing the breath pattern um, when I do it. So not always breathe out with the push, but do it different ways. So people can, um, kind of feel that control no matter what they're doing in real life add in like the arms like I do kind of weird stuff with the straps to try to like mimic load that they would experience in real life while they're in kind of this supported setting mm -hmm. to kind of manage their pressures that way 
Mm -hmm. Great. Great. So usually the last part of our talk, I kind of open the floor so everybody else can ask questions. Um, so that, are you up for that? <laughs> oh yeah. If I don't know, I'll look it up and I can send you an email later too. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so what, I want to know what questions you guys have. Thank you for listening. Um, what questions do you have for Laura? Make them really hard so that we get, okay. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, I, I have a question. Um, first of all, Laura, thank you so much for sharing everything that you've shared. I really appreciate it. And I'm asking um, this question as a personal question because I've seen uh, pelvic floor physical therapists and urologists, all kinds of things. Um, and one of the things that you said is don't go whenever you feel that urgency and don't do the like just in case <laughs> last minute pee before you do anything else which I'm very much guilty of. Um, so, yeah, so thank you for that. But part of the reason I am guilty of it, uh, aside from having that sense of urgency, is that I worked with a urologist and of course, very briefly, not somebody who like has followed up with me over the years or anything, but I was told by him that I actually had lost some of the elasticity in my bladder because I had mm -hmm. been holding for so long and not voiding regularly. And that very much was in line with my lifestyle and not thinking I had time to take care of myself. Right. So how would you advise someone um, to get a sense for, well, two things. Number one, like how often is, what's normal and how often should one go? And then of course that follows into how much one has and they're holding in their bladder. I also learned that I tend to overhydrate, which I right. never knew could actually be an issue. I've been told to drink tons of water my whole life, as right. most of us have. <laughs> so, so could you also address the hydration piece and how much people should be drinking, how much load there should be on the bladder in that regard, and then what's normal for urination? Um, yes, really good questions. Um, mm -hmm. I have heard of people, you know, like where you overextend, but I always been told, right, you have a period where you kind of let the bladder recover. So I would hope you could get some of your elasticity back. Um, usually what they'll have people do is just timed voids and that's about every two hours. Um, so that's kind of a normal frequency, like two to three hours. So if you could get yourself to somewhere close to that, obviously that depends on how much you're drinking. Cause if you're drinking a gallon a day, that's going to be more frequent than someone who's not drinking anything at all. Um, the starting point that I've been taught as a guideline to tell people what to drink is take your body weight in pounds and divide it in half. And that's about how many ounces of fluid you need a day. But that includes the fluid in the foods you eat too. So if you eat a lot of soup or you eat a ton of fruit, that counts as fluid also. Um, it's a myth that coffee is a diuretic, that you can count the coffee as your hydration also. Um, it can be an irritant though, which is why people kind of think it makes you pee more. Um, does that make sense? That absolutely makes sense. Um, and actually is quite consistent with what the urologist told me about making sure you urinate every two, he said it for me every two hours. Yeah. Especially um, and then also to, to recover. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And also I had a question about what, how you were able to determine that the seltzer water was the irritant and not the coffee. And based upon what you just said, um, I definitely think coffee is an irritant for me, perhaps not a diuretic, but, a, but yeah. an irritant. <laughs> so yeah. thank you so much for that. Um, so with that patient, she was, we kind of had a discussion on um, priorities. And she really needed her coffee. And so we kind of ranked her beverages as like what she would be most willing to try giving up for a few days. And this, the um, carbonated water was the easiest to give up. And it happened that it just kind of really worked. And she wasn't willing to give up coffee, even if it was an irritant. So it wasn't even worth trying. Like why? Um, if you can accept a little bit of urgency with coffee and that's really important to you, then no, I'm not going to make you give up coffee. Um, but the um, seltzer water really solved most of our problems. 
Great. I think I, I'll, can I add to that? I think um, that the idea of an elimination diet, even with liquids is very possible and, and foods too, I think. So just the, what basically what Laura ended up doing with that client is taking one thing out, but leaving everything else in and looking for change over the next few days. Um, and if you look at overall gut issues, usually it takes the body about four or five days to recover from an insult. So I, what I've heard as a, maybe as a guideline, if you're trying to figure out what is irritating the bladder or not, is removing a food for four or five days, letting the healing take place, and then give it a couple days to, to see if it's still, um, and if you're fine, then you can add that one thing back in that you took out. And um, if you get the symptoms back again, then you remove it again. So then you know that that was the culprit, right? So if you can get to a place where you've taken out enough things that you don't have the issue, you can add it back in after four or five days and test it, right? And then check. So if you're concerned that something might be irritating you, um, that might be a good way to go about it as well. Yeah. Thank you, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Do, you, do your clients ever talk about um, frequency of uh, feeling like you need to urinate like during the night? I mean, I have, I'm up like three times during the night. I'm like, this is crazy. Yeah. yeah. Um, drink less so water. <laughs> it might be a hydration thing. Yeah. <laughs> if you could stop hydrating so much in the evening. Yeah. Um, that's usually the case with that. It's, um, there, it is normal after 60 to get up once in the night oh. becomes part of life, but three times seems like very disruptive. So I would yeah. try stopping your fluids a little bit sooner in the yeah. evening because you don't have urgency the rest of the day. No, but I'm very much in the habit um, as, as others have said of pee before you leave the house, pee before you see your next client. I mean, yeah, I, I do that all the time. Yeah. So I'll try for every two hours and see how it goes. Try for every two hours and see, and don't like, if you go every hour, do like yeah. an hour and a half first, if you can. I know that's hard with clients. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I've done it. <laughs> it's really bad. I know. <laughs> I know I have, but I think, you know, and this is just a comment from myself. I'm having trouble drinking water during the day. Mm -hmm. So I'm pretty thirsty at night and because it's yeah. because of the mask and I just have to make a point to stop and drink between each client. So anyway, yeah. that's just not my problem. So yeah. Probably and being too. hydrated during the day probably helps keep the urine nice and dilute. So anything you are drinking, that's an irritant. Yes. 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 Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. All right. My new thing: water, more water during the day, less water at night. Um, and I think you know, Kim, to your point, I think that's a really relevant question in this in our group here, because most of us, I do the same thing, right? I don't have the time. I'm actually really thirsty right now, looking at my cup of tea that is not anywhere where I can get to it without leaving the screen, right? So how am I going to get to drink? if I don't have it always right there in front of me while I'm working. And then what happens is you don't end up drinking enough during the day. And then you end up super thirsty in the evening and you drink a lot. And then you get up three times in the night um, to go to the bathroom, which is disruptive. Um, so I think trying to load the, the fluids, maybe, maybe Lori, you have a suggestion, but maybe first in the morning, trying to drink night, a lot of fluid when you first get up and trying to drink a lot, like up till probably the middle or the early afternoon and then trying to taper it down after that um, yeah. could, could help. I mean, the but, hardest thing, especially with masks um, I've found is the healthiest thing for your kidneys and for your bladder is to just kind of consistently drink little bits at a time rather than have like a deluge, you know, at these periods, um, but it's so hard. Like you can't take your mask off in the room with the client and say so you're not drinking. And so it just becomes, right. You chug water at these random places. Um, but yeah, if you could front load your hydration in the day, then you probably won't be as thirsty in the evening because you'll be adequately hydrated. 
Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Yeah, Aaron, please. Hi there. Hi, Lori. Hi. Hi, hi you guys. Um, I did had one comment just about the hydration thing. Um, I think we all know, you know, it's not what you intake, it's what you absorb. So another way to really be hydrated, like I have this stuff, it's called L-Y-T-E and triathletes use it and it's not, It's just some electrolytes and you absorb way more of the water that you're actually intaking. So I don't know, Lori, if that makes sense, but you know, you can drink water all day, but they say you only absorb so much of it. You just pee it out, right? So to really feel hydrated, it's not just how much water you take in, it's how much you're absorbing it, really. Uh, that was just a comment, but maybe not. But my real question, Lori, was about the breathing. If we can go back to um, pelvic floor and breathing. Mm -hmm. um, you would mention, you know, you, you, the, you would mention, I, correct me if I'm wrong, the belly breathing. And for me, everything, all the courses I've taken on this and everything I've learned about this and being a singer for 20 years, the diaphragm, mm -hmm. <laughs> it became it was very easy for me with Pilates to find my inner abdominals because my diaphragm, I knew how to work it laterally, right? Like the bucket handle, right? So what I've been, every, everything I know is like, I'm trying to get people out of belly breathing and into where their lungs actually are because everybody breathes when they come in the class, they do this. And I'm like, this is not where your breath is. It's all auxiliary, right? So they're not really being oxygenated, and they're also not firing multifidi. They're not firing. Uh, they're not firing transverse. They're definitely not, not firing pelvic firing pelvic floor. So I'm saying, breath to me is like crucial to get people to not. You know, um, one instance, uh, Zandi, you were saying when a client came and she did a, your friend did a Pilates class and she was having more incontinence that's usually because they're in the superficial layer and they're, they're not, they haven't even, they're not there. And that's my experience. But if you want to, any intake, anything you have to say about that it would be great. Uh, yeah, I agree. Right. The bucket handle breathing, like the getting the lateral expansion is really important. If someone's just having difficulty, right. Everybody has those where you're just breathing in the neck like you have to start with something super simple and it becomes like, can, can you get your, this hand to be still and your belly hand to move? And then we move into kind of, um, I call it like 360 breathing. I think I had a course with it and it's just trying to get air everywhere, right? In your trunk, but not up in here. So yeah, all of the expansion. Um, Cause yeah, it's going to stretch the fascia in the back. It's going to stretch the pelvic floor muscles and all that fascia. And then you get this like, res um, what's it called? Like recoiling effect, <laughs> right? <laughs> where things uh, tighten up and that's where you kind of are going to start to get your power from. As yeah. It's you kind of like a support, the ham, it kind yeah. of just, yeah. On that exhale. And you don't even have to try to pull your stomach in yeah. when you're actually really just exhaling. There's no gripping through the rear anus or you know what I mean because a lot of people when you try to get into the pelvic floor they're grabbing through the butt yeah do you know what I mean they they grab through the back yeah not the front but that initial trying to get them, stage yeah, of getting them to allow it to go to that full stretch is so important so yeah mm -hmm. anything any cue you have that you can get to work for your clients is great go ahead Allegra thanks I just had a quick question, Allegra, uh, here. Um, so yeah, I guess just building on that, um, I was working with a client the other day, a uh, client, um, you know, she's pretty, you know, she's like in intermediate at Pilates, definitely. And, you know, we were just going over like footwork and she's like, where am I supposed to feel this? I feel like I, you know, can cheat so often. And I don't know, it was just like, we kind of went over like the breathing and the pelvic floor because she admitted to me that she was just pushing into the shoulder rest to like push out, you know, which I think is a common thing. And it's just kind of about like finding that cause it's really easy to cheat in that regards, you know, and then it kind of goes back to the breathing and, 
neutral spine. So, you know, immediately the next day in my class, I was like, just like talking about the neutral spine and just breathing, you know, without, you know, spending too much time and I, you know, they were going in and out, but, um, yeah, I mean, it's just something I think that we get. So, um, just kind of like, let's do the class, let's do the class. And it was just like, yeah, I mean, it, it kind of, I don't know, like a refresher on it every once in a while in the classes, I think would be a good thing or something. Uh, but it's, yeah, there's sometimes where they think they have strength, they're bearing down and pressing into the shoulder rest. And so how do you get someone out of that? Um, I wish, like, I don't have a, <laughs> I wish I had just the easy answer for that. That'd be amazing. Um, I think it kind of varies person to person on what they're doing. I'm sure you guys have found where some, like, right, some of this stuff would be so hard to incorporate into a group class. Um, but easier in your one-on-ones. Um, but I just start, like, if someone is just doing that, just even if they think it's too easy, like, just back to basics and get them to find that breath and those muscles and just the super simple in and out and getting a really nice, um, like, bottom to top, like, abdominal contraction. And just to add on to that, Allegra, the pushing into the shoulder rest, uh, you could, I mean, two things, you could take the shoulder rest out, right, and not have shoulder rest, just put a sticky pad underneath their back, or a yoga mat underneath them, so they don't slide, and have them try and press out from there. And I tend to make the springs a little bit lighter at that point, too, just so that they can start to feel um, the other thing that I do, and Laura, maybe you can speak to this too, is I put them in turnout more than parallel because they can find the inner thighs a little bit more easily or put a ball between the knees, again, to find the inner thighs a little more easily or conversely, put them in a little bit of turn in, right? So all of those things changing the angle can help them find and fire the pelvic floor a little bit. Um, and maybe find the muscles from below without having that shoulder rest there to push up against. Um, and one of the exercises, maybe Laura, you can speak to this too, that I was taught is if you turn feet in and squeeze inward, um, adduct with feet turned in, that it actually really helps activate pelvic floor a little bit without them having to really consciously activate pelvic floor. Um, I don't know if you've had that experience or you agree with that. Um, I don't know if it helps um, activate, but it takes away a lot of the, it makes some of the cheater muscles a little bit harder to access. Okay. So it makes the hip ro external rotators a little bit harder to find. Um, and even like the adductors are not, like you can get them, but they're not quite as grippy. Mm -hmm. So many people think they get their pelvic floor and it's really their glutes. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I love, I love a little bit of turn in for those people that are super grippy in their glutes and everything's happening there and they're fooling everybody and they can do everything, but they're not doing it right. And they actually are really weak in their deep abdominals and pelvic floor because of it. Okay. Well, um, I want to thank you again for all being here. Laura, thank you so much for taking the time and sharing with us a lot of great things. Um, I wanted to just make one more note about the breathing, if I might, just because we talked about rib versus belly. And Laura had talked a lot about that belly breathing and how that stretches. The lateral breathing, um, I think accordion breathing is great for exercising, but I don't know that that's how you want to have them breathe all the time. So making sure that they're having a full inhale, full exhale and, and actually using their belly and getting the air in everywhere for full time uh, for regular life is I think better um, than just having the lateral motion, but trying to incorporate all the motion and get all the stretch in the fashion, all the structures as Laura was talking about was I think really relevant. Is that, do you agree Laura there? Yeah, like that's a component, right? Um, but it can't be the only, um, yeah. the only motion. Yeah, so just a little note of clarification on that. 
And um, if there's no other questions, we will end here. If you guys have another question, I'll hang out for a few minutes. Um, but thanks again for joining. And I look forward to seeing you next week for another case study. And then next month, um, on the first week, uh, the first Thursday of the month, we're going to have um, Dr. Ramsey as for us coming in to talk to us about um, COVID and long COVID. And so what you might see in clients coming in at this point with either post COVID or clients with symptoms of long COVID and what that might look like. Mm -hmm. um, so that um, if you do happen across some of those clients, you might know more what to do for them to help them. So he'll be here on the first Thursday of next um, month, so in October already, that would be. Um, so hopefully you guys can make it then um, and we'll look forward to seeing you.